Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? I am doing fine. I, we got some more good news on the health front. Both my parents are in long-term care right now, and my mm-hmm. mother's been vaccinated. She was vaccinated about um, two weeks ago, and now my father's going to get vaccinated uh, this coming Thursday. So Excellent. couldn't be better news. Couldn't be better news in that front. How are you doing? Well, all right, all things considered. Still kind of running in place, you know, but uh, such is the nature of the world these days. It's the hamster wheel life, the hamster mm-hmm. wheel life. We're all, <laughs> we all have a little bit more idea of what the hamsters go through. Yeah. 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 Every day I go out for my my walk and my wife says, where are you going to go today, Bruce? And I got to say, in a big circle. <laughs> Because I start and end at the same place. You know? Do you try to vary it? Oh, yeah. Big yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Big time. Been lot, lot, walking lots on, on the Sturgeon River this last while. Just fantastic. Nice. And tons, of peop, tons of people use it. It's frozen right to the bottom. And it's just like there's a freeway that runs right through the middle of town in the winter. That unless you're a, you know, a kayaker or something, it's not really available to you in the summer. But. It's uh, it's a real different viewpoint, and I'm loving it. Well, things got so boring around the Staples household that my my 15 year old daughter finally emerged from a room to play a board game with her parents, which Whoa. is a pretty pretty rare occurrence in this, this day and age. Yeah, breaking. <laughs> so that was nice. A little we hadn't been able to persuade one of them or one of the two that are still at home to do that, but that, that was fun. We played Pente, which is a uh, have you oh, ever that's, played that? That's a yes. very uh, it's a good game of strategy. Very interesting. Bruce? I play that in lunch hour uh, when I worked with a bunch of uh, sort of peers uh, uh, when I worked at CIBC. And we, used to, oh, yeah. we had a Pente tournament for several months, the same group of us. So cool. We got, well, there was one guy that would just beat us all, all the time, though. It got a little <laughs> boring eventually. <laughs> uh, let Bruce, we got some. Uh, the Oilers season is looking like it's going to start Wednesday. There was a little scare yesterday with the Canucks, but it looks like they're over. You know, I wasn't hoping that anyone had COVID, but maybe like they came, maybe Elias Peterson came in contact with someone with Peterson and would miss the first game. Would have worked for me. Two games. Um, first two games. But anyway, he's, he's, that's not what happened. They're going to, it looks like they're go, going ahead. Mm-hmm. And there's some news, Bruce. Uh, mm-hmm. Jujar Kara, um, Joachim Nygaard. And Patrick Russell are the three big names of the Oilers players on waivers. Uh, there's a number of players on, and I understand Derek Ryan is one of them out of Calgary on waivers. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yep. There's a number of fairly big name players on waivers. Is James yep. uh, James Reimer? Someone might have mentioned that one. Those are the two oh. names that caught my attention. I'm not I sure. I've heard, but that's the kind of player you'd expect to see on waivers, and it's also the kind of player you'd expect to see 30 teams pass on. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the news conference with Oscar Clefbaum and the orders have changed their broadcasting team. They've um, on the way out are Mr. Quinn and Mr. Remenda and coming in as Jack Michaels. And it looks like Louis DeBrusque um, is the, the only color guy for the year, maybe related to the, the fact that broadcast teams aren't going to travel as much and the, the home team, the home guy will do uh, the broadcast for, for uh, both uh, away home and away teams. And mm-hmm. without that travel, they just are going to rely on the one guy. So Bruce, we'll talk about all of those things on this mm-hmm. grand day. All right. Let's start with uh, Jujar Kyra, mm-hmm. Jujar Kyra, Kyra. And um, you know, Bruce, I did a little poll on the waving of Jujar Kara. Let's see if I can find it again. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> the question was, and we've had 1,500 votes and just it's just been up a couple hours, so pretty heavily subscribed already. We'll probably get about double that in the end. But the, the, the results won't change because they don't tend to after you get oh. about 1,000 votes. Uh, which NHL... Oh, wrong poll. Here we go. Sorry. I'll, I'll read this poll too, though. Which NHL team will go deepest in the playoffs this year? I asked fans. This is a different poll. Edmonton, 75%. Toronto, <laughs> Toronto, Toronto, 8.6%. Calgary, 9.4%. And some other Canadian team, 7.4%. Yeah. 
So uh, you're not followed by a, a, a majority of Oilers fans by any chance, are you, David? There's a possibility that that is the case, Bruce, mm. and that uh, the majority of Oilers fans um, like them some Edmonton Oilers. Okay, here's the Kara poll. This is this has 962 votes, so it's it's getting into that era where it's that spot where this is pretty oh, solid oh. results. If the Oilers lose Juja Kara on waivers, what would that mean for the team? Question mark. The first, he's easily replaced, 81.8%. Let that sink in. That's Oiler fans, Bruce, mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a major loss, 4.7%. Other, other responses, because there's, you know, there might be a whole cornucopia of other, other mm -hmm. thoughts. 13.4% for others. So, Bruce, we've watched Jujar Carey. He was drafted in 2014. 2012. 2012. He's drafted in 2012. It's now 2020. He's been eight years in the organization. Mm -hmm. Many you and I watched him play in the AHL when we were mm -hmm. watching AHL TV. We watched him, of course, for watched, a number of years now. Go ahead. I watched him play with Everett Silvertips. Wowza! It live, yeah, live. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. saw, and we've seen him with the Oilers now for a, a couple of years. We've seen a lot of him, and 82 mm -hmm. percent of people who are fans of the team, almost all of them. So that's not a big poison pen boat. That's or like poison Canucks fans and Flames fans weighing in. It's my followers on, on that account are, are mostly all Oilers fans. They are not, uh, they're not too worried about this. This is in part, Bruce, I think, due to the fact that the Oilers have such great depth this year with McLeod, Ryan McLeod, who's, who's now penciled in, was in the fourth line today. Gaetan Haas, who's still out, I believe, unfit to play. Long time there. And um, Devin Shore on a PTO, a, a, a long time NHLer. What do you make of that? those results and what do you make of Caron waivers? Well, I think they're, they're just dangling them out there to see if uh, some team wants to take their co uh, the contract off their hands. Because if a t team were to pick up uh, Caron and his one year remaining at $1.2 million, and the orders were to sign Devin Sure, and, I mean, and we will say the default amount would be the NHL minimum of seven hundred thousand, you know, or certainly something very close to that. Uh, they'd save, you know, a cool half million dollars against the cap by doing that as a as a straight player exchange. Um, if he doesn't get claimed, and I'd say the odds are that he won't. It's not impossible that he'll get claimed, though. Uh, but I'd suggest he's unlikely to. It's just so damn many players on the waiver wire today uh, that uh, uh, there's no guarantee that he'll go to the taxi squad, but they'll be free to move him about to the taxi squad. The thing is, every player clears waivers uh, once. Then any time in the next 30 days, uh, the team can move him freely back and forth. And it's only if he's on the roster and they have to clear him out that it's more than 30 days have passed or if he's played 10 or more games that they have to waive him again. So you're going to see a lot of these, a lot of these moves where, where a guy gets waived and then he's moved around for a while, but you might see the same guy get waived two or three times during the season too. If there's lots of movement on a certain team's taxi squad. Anyway, that's uh, my take is they're, they're just testing the market and seeing, uh, what the interest is, they wouldn't be crushed if he got taken because, like I say, they would that would be a way for the club to save a little money against the payroll. That said, uh, they are faced with a little bit of a dilemma in how they manage the payroll and how they manage w the manner in which they choose to deal with the Oscar Clefbaum uh, long term uh, injured reserve situation. So it's um, uh, it's a little bit tricky that saving money doesn't necessarily mean saving against the cap, depending on how the numbers fall. And for that, I would, uh, uh, to give you a, a, a detailed answer on that, I would need a PhD in capology, which I don't have. But I would refer you to the excellent Puckpedia and uh, Hart Levine, uh, who's uh, a regular interviewee on... Uh, Oilers now, uh, low down with low tide, other radio shows, but he's got an excellent Twitter feed, and he is uh, uh, he's the local ace on all things salary cap related. Bruce, what what would you put the odds? Just give me a, a number, like 
like 90 10 that they, he won't be taken or 50 50 or what would you say i'd say one in three chance he gets taken there may be some team that's sweet on the the guy or has a specific need where they hey geez look at that big guy he's a, you know remember that one time he got into a fight with our guy and got the better of him or he had a couple of real good games against us last year and you know our penalty kill needs a little bit of a boost and you know it's only 1.2 million you know it's like we can we can fit that in under the cap so you know there is it only takes one so it's it, it's certainly not impossible it's not like he's got James Neal's contract and he's on waivers right it's uh um, if you like the idea of a great big 26 year old with 200 games of NHL experience and a bit of a mean streak or a, can carry a bit of a mean streak until then, penalties. Yeah. 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 Like he, he's, he's not without, uh, he's not without merit, but, uh, his five, five V five play has been in the tank for the last two years. So that's, that's what most people see and remember. I think the, uh, Personally, I think the Oilers would be better off if he gets taken by another team. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he could use a second opinion. I think he could use a new home. Just the fact that the fans, like, you know, these are people who are knowledgeable, hardcore. These are the faithful, right? right. And they're saying, he's this isn't worked out here for this player in Edmonton, essentially, with that kind of, you know, they're not worried about him going and he's easy to replace the um, The fact is, I think ha- either Haas or Devonshore would be a better player in the lineup every day. I'd rather see either of them, personally, than mm-hmm. Juju or Kara. I don't think they need his toughness. I think the Oilers have enough toughness between the player like Larson, Nurse, Cassian, especially Chase on James Neal. This isn't a this isn't a pushover lineup. Dry Settle's a big guy. This isn't a pushover lineup, um, especially in this modern NHL the way it's going. I don't think it is. So um, they don't really need that that aspect of of his game. I don't mind him in the lineup. I, I, I last year I didn't like him at all playing with Riley Shea and I thought that that was that yeah. line with, with those two guys was too big and too slow and if people are looking at bad results in plus minus for Shane and Kara well I, I blame the coach part partially for that 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 lineup had no chemistry right from the start of the year and they kept going back to it for a long time till they finally stopped doing it so I actually think Riley Shane was a much better player than Jujar Kara especially including on the P, the PK and um you know, a little bit underrated in Edmonton because of those bad plus minus numbers that were partly driven by a bad combination of players. Devin Shore, Bruce, outscores Kara at even strength, 1.4 points over the last two years per 60 minutes, even strength to 1.16 for Kara. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is Devin Shore, a Devin Shore that hasn't put up any kind of scoring numbers in the last couple of years. He's just, you know, compared to the, the start of his career when he got 30 points two years in a row for the Dallas Stars mm-hmm. and looked like he might become something. And then he fell off as a player. I don't know why, maybe injury. Uh, uh, who knows what it is with, with, with that little bit of fall off. And when you, when you have a little bit of fall off and you're a third or fourth line guy, you know, you find yourself looking for a job in the NHL. So I'm hoping that Kara gets picked up. I think it's, I would say it's about a one in 10 chance that he gets picked up. I think... Other, there may be the, and the only thing that, you know, cause he's earning 1.2 million. There's a lot cheaper players out there. So that's a, yep. uh, B it's kind of hard to make moves this year. Like it's complicated to move people around and every team's just trying to f- figure out, like they've already made their plans essentially, I think. And I don't think a lot of teams are, I don't think we're going to see many waiver wire pickups at all. We see, we saw Noah Juleson. Yep. Uh, top pick of the Habs move to Florida today. We may not see many others at all. Um, no. I just think that like so many teams are pressed up to the cap and they're just they're just trying to figure out and they can't work in. A lot of teams would like Derek Ryan, for instance. Derek Ryan's a very good hockey player. And um, let me just look up his numbers for the last two years. His points per 60, which is a very good, I think, over two years, a very good... Um, uh, Derek Ryan. He's got one year to run on a three-year deal that's a AAV of $3.125 million. Ooh. And he is 34 years old, which is... Bruce, he scored 1.83 points per game, per 60 last year. Guess who was tied with him? Tyler Toffoli, 1.83. Uh, uh, who mm-hmm. else do we... So, you know... Think about that. Think about the line mates that Toffoli had as compared to Derek Ryan, probably. I don't know. Who, who was Ryan's line mates? I can't remember. Um, 
did he play with? Uh, Generally, bottom six. Yeah, exactly. Probably play with Lucic. <laughs> if you can do that playing with Lucic. Cassian was at 1.81. Um, Phil Kessel, 1.84. Joe Thornton, 1.84. Anyway, uh, Derek Ryan, I think, if the Oilers had money, boy, that would be a nice little player to add to your roster. But it's interesting that the Flames have waived him. I mean, um, fascinating. Maybe that's a cap move on their part. I don't know how pressed up they are against the cap. And a calculation that no team's going to be able to take on that amount of money. Although you could see, like, would not a team like Ottawa think, wow. Um, you know, if you if you just want to compete this year and, and you're, you need to get to the cap. But I think everyone's probably at the cap now. Well, there's a couple teams out there that have cap space. I understand Nashville's got some cap space, and they've uh, they've cleared out a few of their centers that a guy like Derek Ryan might make sense for them. So, I mean, like I say, it only takes one team, right, to uh, to jump on a guy on waivers that fits their specific situation, what they need and what they can afford, what their budget is, uh, you know. But if it's a good fit and the guy's there for free, why not? Why not? So, Joachim Nygaard is also on waivers. Bruce, we both really liked his play in Sweden this year, I think, especially as he got going, got ramped, ramped it up, coming back from a broken hand. And uh, I just, I like his, uh, his tremendous speed and his tenacity. He's a very, dig, digs in there, battles hard for the puck. He's defensively responsible. I would prefer that he not, that he stick around with the team. Um, he's, you know, Tyler Benson is... You know, here's the thing, though. If you have to, you have to pick between players, and Tyler Benson's also competing for that job. There's James Neal, who's not, who's got the long contract. He's not going anywhere, and um, a number of other much more promising players like Annis and Cahoon and Nugent Hopkins on the left side. So, um, Josh Archibald's now playing on, the, still playing on the left side for now. So, yep. Nigard was in tough. The coach really likes Josh Archibald. That would be the role he would be competing for um, mm -hmm. with on that side of the ice. And he just, it was, again, a numbers game. But I, I don't think anyone's going to take him, I think. But I think it would be actually, if you needed a forward, he'd be a, and you need a fourth-line guy, Joachim Nygaard is a good hockey player. Yeah, there's a I, few guys available, though, that are pretty good hockey players that have a higher profile. Yeah. So... Uh, it would be, I'd be surprised if he got picked up, even though, like, I agree with you that it would be a, an interesting small bet for another team to make. But then the thing about claiming guys on waivers is that you then have to not only be able to afford the guy in your system, but you have to clear someone else out to make room for him. And in some ways, it's, you know, I think GMs are reluctant because they don't want to mess with the chemistry in the room. They want to tell them that, hey, you know what? This guy that wasn't good enough to make Edmonton is better than you. And, oh, yeah, I did such a crappy job as GM last year that I'm picking up Edmonton's rejects rather than have my own team stop. So there, there's sort of a few sort of psychological um, uh, and sort of human relations things that push against the waiver pickups. And that's a big reason to me why why they are as rare as they are. Like there's, you don't see many waiver pickups all season long, typically. Well, very few of them work out either. Like of the yeah. ones that are made, like that's the other thing. These are marginal players generally, and they don't they don't often work out. So um, there's the exception to the rule, but the rule is that they don't appreciably help a team. I think I haven't done a study of this, but I'm just going by unless, recent, certainly by recent Oilers history. Unless your team is dumb enough to waive Ray Whitney. <laughs> all right all right so bruce there's some new lines today let's just quickly go we won't mm. talk about the top three lines too much because they're the same the lines at practice but the, the right. fourth so we have archibald Turris and puglia yarvi on the third line which i think is an interesting third line and i don't know if they're going to get tough minutes that third line that might be more of a soft minutes third line right like not they're not going to McDavid and Drysaddle, they're going to soak up the toughest competition. Um, so so the, the the easy minutes, soft minutes line is an interesting line because I think that line could score, sc score some goals. Anyway, the fourth line is Tyler Ennis, uh, Alex Chason, and uh, Ryan McLeod. So uh, it takes me a second with all these McLeods and Chasons. I think mm -hmm. it's Steve Chason. Uh mm -hmm. What's the other McLeod's name? His brother there, uh, Ryan McLeod, and 
What's his brother in New Jersey? Mike. 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 Is it Mike? Yeah, Mike. And okay. McLeod. Anyway, uh, McLeod, Bruce, we, we watched him in Switzerland this year, so we have a mm-hmm. bit of a take on his game. My take is that he is a very uh, fast, he's a big, fast player. He looked great on the European ice. He can be an NHL player. He's got that potential. He's not a super skilled player. Like, he doesn't make super quick decisions with the puck, but he can he can get off a good pass if he's got some time on the power play to look around. Like, he, he was an okay power player in the Swiss League, but I don't see him in that role in the NHL because I don't see that high level of skill. My main, to, to make the NHL, he has got to become a superlative defensive hockey player. He's got everything. He, he, he's got the size and the speed to do it. I think he's agile enough, but he's got to take care of the fundamentals, which is fundamentally be on the right side of your man in the defensive zone. Mm-hmm. Don't let him get on the other side of you when you're covering the net. Help those defensemen around the net. Don't get sucked into the corner too much. Like don't, you know, just cover that front of the net and help out the defenseman. If he can do that and diligently like Haas does, like Gaetan Haas does, which is why I like him so much as a player. If he can do that, he, he's got this he's got the other assets which turn him into the NHL and NHL player. He was kind of hit and miss. I'm still seeing in Switzerland this year in that aspect of his game. So I'm there there's reasons to be excited about him, but I'm still thinking this strikes me as premature and we'll probably see Haas or Shore in that spot as things go along, if not for the first game. Yeah, he's still in his draft plus three season. He only had one year left to junior. So he was very young as, you know, when he turned pro last year, he would have been the youngest player on his team. And uh, he was, um, uh, you know, and I, he's progressing, but uh, it's not like he was a surefire bet as a first round pick. Uh, to be an NHLer, and typically it takes a good three or more years for the second and subsequent rounds to uh, uh, to make it. So I'm pleasantly surprised uh, to see him elevated even briefly today to be considered in that spot when there's you know an experienced NHLer like Devin Shore that's on the fifth line by the all sounds of how today's uh, workout went and. Whether he's a placeholder while they figure out what happens with J.J. Kara tomorrow, uh, that could be. But it uh, sounds like he's, um, they think he's getting closer. And maybe that's one of the reasons they decided to waive J.J. Kara. I think, well, you know, McLeod is close to being that caliber of player already. Or maybe they think he's already better. Who knows? But uh, Well, there's uh, a chance, right, that he's mm-hmm. better than Kara. Like that's not a chance that it will be. Yes. Well, there might even be a chance now, although, you know, the thing we forget about Kara is by the time he was done in the AHL, JJ Kara was a dominant AHL hockey player in, in the end. Like he really was, he was playing in all situations and he was doing very well as an AHLer. Um, McLeod hasn't reached that level yet. So yeah, I just, I, I think this is more of a, they haven't sh- signed shore to a, PTO, so they can't really have him in that fourth line spot yet because they don't right. know if they're going to. I don't know what's happening with Haas. Like, is, there, is he here in Canada even? Like, I don't even know that. And um, it's very, it's too bad because this was a golden opportunity for Gaetan Haas. Like, he's he is oh, a fine, yeah. he's he. I I think he is a, a really strong fourth line center possibly. Like, he's he's smart. He's defensively responsible. He's fast. He can score the odd goal. Like I, I like him as a player, so I don't know what's happening. And he happened. did everything right. Like he went home and played in a bunch of games, so he'd come into training camp on a bit of a roll, and you know he did get hot, especially towards the end of his time there. And then he had this contact, and all you know, it set all that plan right off the rails. So we do have at least some clarity on James Neal, who was in practice today, and who was in uh, special teams practice on Saturday, and he's still kind of skating as sort of a fifth wheel out there, from the sounds of it. But I heard a blurb from him on Oilers Now, and he was set back by quarantine, and he had to, I guess he had to be quarantined for the full two weeks. Uh, but it doesn't sound like there's any kind of injury, so I'm not even sure, like, there's been a lot of chat that he's going to start the season on injured reserve, but I don't know what the injury would be that he would have to do that. So uh, I guess we'll hear more, but uh, he's out there and, and in the mix and says, you know, he's working his butt off to try and catch up from the time he missed wonder if he could skate. I wonder oh. if they found a rink for him to skate in in those two weeks. Um, Patrick Russell, 
Anton Forsbury and Alan Quine were also placed on waivers. Quine's a really top scoring AHL player, kind of in the Cooper Marodi road, like uh, mold a few years along. He's a bit older than Marodi. Patrick Russell, we also all saw him score zero goals last year, but work his butt off and be responsible defensively. And probably, you know, if he had had any kind of puck luck, would have had four or five goals, to be fair Even to him. Even some ref luck, he would have had Even one. Some, yeah. And Forsbury is their th- Third, they had to waive him. He's the third yeah. string goalie. So you you got you can't you can only protect two goalies. That's and no one's going to take any of those players. I think you can keep three, but uh, why would they? Right? Nobody's going to take them. That's what the taxi yeah. squad is for. I think yeah. you might see a team or two like maybe Toronto wind up going with the three headed monster on their active roster, just because they don't want to risk losing their number three. But I really don't see Anton Forsberg as being that guy. Bruce, we uh, there was an interview with um, Oilers media, people who cover the team, uh, with Oscar Clefbaum today. And um, it was kind of a, I found it to be kind of a sobering uh, mm-hmm. interview. I don't know if you watched it, but, you know, he seems, um, he keeps saying the shoulder's getting better. Um, but he's also talking about how he wants surgery and he's in pain to the extent, he sounds like he's in chronic pain. Um, which does. is allevi- alleviating somewhat and um, can't sleep very well. And, and then he's now he's having trouble in terms of getting, getting surgery. My cat's here. He's having trouble in terms of getting surgery because um, travel's restricted. He wants to go to Cleveland. You know, it's, you can see like, go to Cleveland. Okay. What do I do then? I'm in the hospital. Where do I go next? Like it, you know, it's, everything's harder uh, with COVID, you know, that's going to alleviate, in the next year, six months, you know, as the people get vaccinated, the world will, will open up again. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness for that. Uh, but I, it was just very, I just felt kind of sad if I'm completely honest, Bruce, I don't know how you felt. It was just like, here's this guy, like he's the, he looks like the epitome of health. I mean, oh. he's built like a Greek God, Oscar Clefbaum. Mm-hmm. He's, he was such a fine hockey player in the 2017 mm-hmm. playoffs. He he might he might have I thought he was probably the Oilers' best player other than Drysaddle perhaps in those playoffs, um, and he was trending towards being a I think a really effective NHL D man maybe a number one D man if he could replicate that 2017 level of play, but since then and and you you pointed out he got hurt in that in against Anaheim was it and game five the same game that Andrew Secker got hurt. And they both missed game six, and Clefbaum came back and played but wasn't effective in game seven. And the, from the next year and the, all the years since, he's been kind of in and out with, with uh, you know, not, they don't always tell you a whole lot about what's going on, but my understanding is that shoulder has, uh, has uh, been a problem for a long time, including even before that Anaheim series. But I think when he got racked up in that terrible game five, which is... Uh, uh, with all the crap that happened, one of the worst, most difficult games in Oilers history, where they had the three nothing lead and Anaheim pulled the goalie and scored three in a row, and then Corey, the, including the, including the Ryan Kessler grabbing t- Talbot's pad goal to tie it up with 15 seconds left, and then Corey frickin' Perry scoring an over double overtime. After Oilers had three defensemen in the dressing room. What brutal. did you think of the Clef Bombs interview yourself? Uh, well, I didn't hear all of it, but the parts that I did hear were sobering is a very good word. And it sounds like, you know, he wants to come back, but he's uh, there's no guarantee that we're going to see this guy again, to be honest. You know, from, yeah. from my takeaway today is that there's, there's a non-zero chance that he's done. It's I mean, Well, he was talking about, is this correct? Like, I think I read a quote, shoulder replacement. That's one of the options, and I think that's a, that would be that would put the end of the hockey dream right there. I, well, I, didn't I Bo Jackson? Bo Jackson tried. got a hip hip replacement and tried to play baseball and football. Did he try to play football again? No, after he that? didn't ever try to play football. Again. He tried to play baseball again. Yeah. So here's some quotes from Clefbaum in case you missed that interview. Quote: It's one thing to be on the ice and take some pain medication and anti inflams and all that. Play though, play through it. But when you can't sleep or put your clothes on properly, it comes to a point where your body says, no, you should not do this anymore. I don't want to be on pain meds 24-7 and not really have a worthwhile private life. 
Wow. Yeah, they these players, this is not an uncommon story in hockey. Mm-hmm. And it's it's uh it's the price that professional athletes pay uh to play this aggressive exciting game that we all love but man uh i my heart just went out to oscar cleffbaum i just hope the best for the guy because that just i've known like i i've known people who have experienced chronic pain right and what it has done to their life it is debilitating and uh, you wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy and um so hopefully oscar cleffbaum who is not our worst enemy was one of our hockey heroes uh can come back but i'm I think that I uh, I have doubts about it just from what he had, from what he was saying. We'll see. Well, the good news from his perspective is that financially he's set. I mean, even if he can't play again, he's got three more years to come in at four million dollars plus. Yeah. Uh, on top of the four years that he's already been paid, you know, he got that seven-year deal that everybody's called a bargain. Um, but from a team perspective. You know, here's the flip side of one of those deals where here we are at the on the cusp of a new season, trying to figure out how to get how to finesse the guy's cap hit onto the uh, long-term injured reserve with the least amount of loss possible, where the best possible situation is to exactly match dollar for dollar and break even. Otherwise, you're losing money off of your uh, cap space with him, and pretend and. And it also it crimps your style and sorts of things you can do in the off season and stuff, and potentially two more years of that. So uh, that you know that's one of the risks you take when you sign long term players. And certainly we've got many examples around the league of guys who are still getting paid who haven't played for years. You know, usually when you sign these long term deals with guys in their twenties, it's mm-hmm. a good. It usually works out usually. fairly okay. It, the long-term deals for people over 30, the reason there's such risks is because of this, right? Mm-hmm. Like just the toll of playing right. physical hockey, of playing hockey comes in and, and hammers you. Uh, but usually guys in their 20s work out like the Eberly contract, the r mm-hmm. contract, the Hall contract. I think generally speaking, they, they all paid, at least paid for the, for, you know, whichever team had them at the time were good deals. And we're seeing great returns from the dry settle contract. McDavid contract, of course, is is fan, fantastic for the Oilers to have that player. But this is one where you do yeah. see the downside. Bruce, I had one jolt when I was listening to Clefbaum. He was talking about how he had a uh, he kind of separated his shoulder way back when he was playing for for uh, Farge's dads in um, Sweden, and it just like and Broberg suddenly flashed in my head like the injuries that he just received. So like you know, I don't want to. That was just like probably an irrational. A uh, fear reaction all of a sudden to a similar kind of player, to yeah. to Clefbaum. But Broberg got banged up pretty good and kept playing. So we'll we'll, we'll be monitoring that. We'll be following him uh, the rest of his games. I'm going to be tuning into some of his games. And Dylan Holloway will be, will be following Carter Savoy. We'll still be watching those games through the year. But uh, hopefully Broberg's okay. Yeah, well, the, the news on that front is mostly good, but. Uh... Uh, the excellent Swedish poster, who's uh, one of the commenters on Low Tide's blog, who's a, uh, not just lives in Sweden, but apparently he's a medical doctor. Uh, so he's got some contacts, and he knows the uh, physiotherapist on Broberry's team. And, and he said he's got some kind of a soft tissue injury that they expect him to miss the next two weeks. So that's not, you know, that's kind of sigh of relief territory for me. That's yeah, we weeks, heard a Charlie horse. Months. We heard a Charlie horse, right? Like mm-hmm. that was the main, uh, and then he looked like he got hit again. Like he was right. hurt a couple times, different times. Anyway. Yeah. Broberry will be, we'll be back and flying hopefully. And we will, we'll keep an eye on that and we'll watch those. I'm looking forward to seeing him again, uh, yeah. play when he gets healthy. Cause that was really no discouraging kidding. to see him play when he wasn't was healthy. Totally like that. Disappointing. <laughs> wasn't it? Wasn't it? Like we, you know, we had been watching oh him and getting excited. And so, you know, you see up and in, it can inconsistency in his game, but it's mainly, it seemed like it was due to confidence, not, any kind of injury thing, but to see him going at like half speed, that was tough to take. Uh, Bruce, the Edmonton mm. Oilers have announced the, the, is it Sportsnet or the Oilers or both, whatever it is. However, thing, these things work, it's a business partnership, right? They're one and right. the same on a certain level. They've announced a change in TV announcers out. Our, um, uh, Drew Remenda's gone. And Quinn, what is Quinn's first name? It's just this. Kevin kid. Quinn. Kevin Kevin Quinn was escaping me in the moment. Kevin Quinn and Drew Remenda in Jack Michaels for TV. And Louis DeBrus looks like he's going to do all the home games. And Cam Moon's going to do from Red Deer is going to do the radio games. 
I don't have a lot to say about this. It's just, you know, really, this is a tough industry. Like people, um, remember Eddie Keene once, the famous Ched broadcaster telling me, David, he said, David, you know, in the end, no one's career in the media ends very well. And it's a brutal game. And he, <laughs> he was telling me that to his steps on John Geiger and me. We were these two young guys in their, in their 20s just starting out at the Edmonton Journal. And it can be a tough business. And I, my heart goes out to, to Drew Romenda and, and Kevin Quinn right now. Uh, mm-hmm. who are out of work. Um, I re- I wanted to say about Drew Amenda. I mm-hmm. know that he's a controversial figure, yep. and I know that he ticked off a lot of Oilers fans with his yep. talking too much in the early days about San Jose. I really give Drew Romenda credit for the discipline that he, how much, considering how much he loved talking about the San Jose games, which was mm-hmm. a big mistake to do, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, he showed a lot of self-discipline. He didn't hardly mention it at all in the last couple of years when he realized that he had become a problem. But he got off on the wrong foot here mm-hmm. doing that. And a lot of people never forgave him for that. But I have to say, I really liked his work. I thought he was an astute announcer who tended, you know, in a, in a job where it's kind of hard to throw the overhand right constantly mm-hmm. because you know you're close to the team you're promoting the product they don't really like heavy criticism but i thought he did a good job of giving fair criticism and now and then like naming a player by name who had made a mistake not to call out the player as a terrible player but to talk about a bad mistake that the player talk had made. about the mistake talk yeah. about the mistake rather than the player i thought drew did a good job and i thought his insights were were very useful and welcome so I like Drew Remenda's work, and I want to wish you, Drew, if you're if you're listening to this, I wish you well. You did a great job here in Edmonton. I hope you get another chance in broadcasting. What's your take, Bruce? Well, I guess it's – I've decided to freshen things up uh, to some degree. That I mean, Kevin Quinn's been in place for a long, a long, long time, and now Jack Michaels gets the boost from radio to, uh, uh, to TV. Uh, frankly uh, – I almost never listen to games on the radio anymore because I'm always watching the the, the broadcasts on on uh, on TV. I know he brings a certain energy to the radio broadcasts that uh, hopefully will translate well to TV. Uh, if I have one criticism, it's sometimes he tends to wander from what's actually going on and trying to talk about other subjects during the play. Hopefully, that's something that uh, won't be an issue uh, in his uh, in his new gig. Uh, I'll also say I'm, I'm very pleased to, to see Cam Moon get the shot at the, at the, as being the radio voice. He's, of course, been the radio voice and the chief media guy for Red Deer Rebels for just a long, long time. And an uh, uh, excellent fellow. I worked with Cam. Well, worked with. I, I worked through Cam to get uh, um, uh, access to some Red, Rebels uh, home games. Uh, I went to a number of games over the years that uh, uh, when Brian Nugent Hopkins was there, noticeably, or, or uh, uh, just the odd game here and there over the years. And he's just an excellent fellow, very, very thoughtful, very thorough, and a good announcer. And so that uh, that's a nice break. Uh, that's a nice break for, uh, for Cam Moon. And when you say he's going to be doing the play-by-play from Red Deer, what I'm assuming you're meaning is he's from Red Deer, but he's actually going to be <laughs> in the building doing the play-by-play. Anyway, I, I'm wondering, and I think our, our colleague Kurt, Kurt Levin said something about this, if the broadcasters are going to spend a whole lot less tra- time traveling and a whole lot more time doing games, covering games for both teams, where both the home and away teams get the same feed from the same announcers. And it, it's... Logistically, it makes sense. Uh, from an audience perspective, you wouldn't have the consistency of, uh, of voices that maybe you're used to. So it'll be interesting to see how they go with that. Uh, and Bruce, initially the Oilers hadn't mentioned uh, Quinn and Dramenda in their tweet about it, but they did send out a tweet uh, 50 minutes ago now. Mm-hmm. And they said, they did say, uh, we'd like to extend our sincere thanks oh, and good. gratitude. To Kevin Quinn and Drew Remenda for bringing their passion, talent, and dedication to many order broadcasts over the years. That, so that was a real serious omission from the original tweet. I noticed that with, with disapproval. So I'm glad to see that they, uh, they've they corrected that. Yeah. There's a couple quick lineup things, Bruce. I just want to go over real mm-hmm. quick, uh, yep. and then we'll say goodbye. Um, Kyler Yamamoto was on the top power play unit, which... Uh, alternating with chase on now maybe that's just because neil was out and they 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 just like to alternate that guy and get different looks 
I thought that was interesting and exciting. And the like, I know that Kyler Yamamoto ain't going to screen a goalie. Like that's really not going to happen. <laughs> and that's really important to screen a goalie because when the pass goes cross seam, if for a Oops. second you have wow. a few players blocking the goalie's view, that's really big. So that's the downside of that move. And Chase on and Neil were very good at that. But the Especially positive side, on. could you imagine the puck going down low? Excuse me. The puck going down low to um, uh, Yamamoto right by the crease. You know, the, the the pass goes down low and Neil will get it and try to jam it in. Someone with Yamamoto's speed and hands in that spot and passing ability, mm-hmm. um, getting the puck there, I just mm-hmm. think having that little guy <laughs> beside the net with the amount of skill he has could scare mm-hmm. the hell out of an NHL goalie. He could be very dangerous behind the net, around the net, and it would be a different look for the Oilers, but I kind of got excited That's about for that. Sure. That's for sure. The other thing we saw was Evan Bouchard in the three-on-three drill today for mm-hmm. overtime. What did you make of that? Like they had Tyson Berry as the top guy. Cause usually we saw, you know, to expect Darnell nurse, right? They had yep. Clef bomb usually and Clef bomb mm-hmm. and nurse were their go-to guys. And then Barry. bear was number three. Yeah. So maybe, maybe they're just trying out Bouchard, but you know, you'd expect to see Barry and nurse, but Evan Bouchard is a hell of a hockey player and um, three on three, he could do some damage. What did you think of it? Might as well see what you got. I mean, that's what the, camp is for they don't get any preseason games you know they don't get a chance to throw these guys out there but if he's going to be uh, on the roster or the taxi squad and i suspect the latter at first just because of the numbers game uh but when he gets in there uh you know you in an overtime situation there you really cut down on the bench the orders typically go with only four forwards in overtime and two or maybe three defensemen, but uh, you want your puck movers in that situation, right? You're big. You don't ever see Adam Larson in overtime, for example. Even if he played 20 minutes during the regulation time, he's just not the right style of player for overtime. And a guy that can uh, that can handle and move the puck, maybe score the goal that wins it for you, is uh, is uh, the kind of player that. That they so I it doesn't surprise me that they're looking at. I mean they know what Darnell Nurse can do in three on three. They don't really know Tyson Berry because they're still learning the player to some degree I expect. And ditto for Evan Bouchard. So why not give it a look? If it was me, I'd like to see Caleb Jones mm-hmm. uh, three on three. Fair. I haven't seen Tyson Berry, so I don't know. Nurse mm-hmm. is okay, but um, you know he's not a great skill attacker. He's an okay skill attacker. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like. I would prefer to see Jones uh, and uh, um, Barry out there, and I also do. I like the idea of Evan Bouchard. Nurse is pretty good, though. I mean, he's. It's not. That's not terrible. Ethan Bear is pretty good. There's. There's, there's lots of options. Yeah. You know, the thought of. I don't know if they do this, but the thought of having. Uh, you, could they have two righties together, um, on their third pairing, Bruce? Like with, if you have. Uh, well, sure, they could. I mean, teams have done that, um, but it's a rare situation because just because the lefties outnumber the righties by a wide margin, it's far more likely a team to have a pair of all lefty pairing than an all righty pairing. But gee, St. Louis, I mean, uh, last year they had uh, Petrangelo and Carrico as a regular pairing, just two stud right hand shot defensemen. They played a ton of minutes together, at least the games I saw, and, and it works. I mean, the only difference is that almost all good left-handed defensemen have experience uh, during their development years of being switched over to the right-hand side for precisely the reason that there's not enough righties on many teams. Whereas most righties just play right the whole time because there's not enough righties to to have access to play on the left side. So it's more it tends to be more of a learning experience for the righty that has to move over than for the lefty who has to do the same thing. It's really cool that you finally they finally have this kind of depth and right shot defense. No so, Bruce, kidding. here's my question. <laughs> I'm going to try to stump you, and you have the the great memory for the old time Oilers. Have the Oilers ever had better depth of right shot defense when playing the right side? Oh boy! Because uh, Huddy played, he was left shot. He was a lefty playing the right side. What was Muni? Was he a lefty player? Muni was a lefty playing the right side. Greg was a lefty playing the right side. So they only had, uh, for part of that time, Lee Fogelin as a a righty. 
Ritzelainen uh, was a righty, uh, wasn't he? Ritzelainen was a, was a righty, but they Siltan. never had like Siltman yeah. was a righty, but yeah. they've always had like a couple of them. I mean, they had Jason Smith and Steve Stales for for a number of years that were both righties, but they didn't have like three, four, or five of them very often. And and the teams, you know, the most famous defensemen on the team are pretty much all lefties from from history, right? Yeah, so. I think this is the best group of right shooting defensemen the, the Oilers have ever had. So that's cause for celebration. Mm-hmm. And um, good work by, I guess, there's a little bit of co- colorful history in assembling that group of right shot defensemen when you, when you include Adam Larson uh, the, with the Taylor Hall trade. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that, that group was assembled generally under Shirelli, except for Tyson Berry, who's come in uh, right just this year so very interesting development it's great to have that kind of right depth and is Lenstrom still on what's what's have you heard about the he's one still, guy they didn't have to waive him because he's on an entry-level contract so he can be assigned directly to uh the taxi squad without need to clear waivers the guys okay. that were put on waivers today have to so there was no sign of Bouchard uh McLeod Yamamoto Lenstrom, that's the four guys in camp that are on uh, entry-level contracts. So there was no need to do any sort of formal paper move with any of those guys. They have free reign to do what they want, which is why I think uh, a guy like Evan Bouchard's apt to start the season on uh, on the um, taxi squad because they don't have to try and sneak him through. Said, whereas William Lagerson, for instance, I suspect that today's series of moves was done in such a way as to protect having to move him because I thought they might lose him. Well, they might. Like, I don't know. I don't think they would. But, the, you know, it, it, it might be more like a one and three thing uh, that Lagerson, I think he would, he's a pretty decent hockey player, but I don't think another team would take him either. I, I just think they're, they're just all so wedded to their uh, rosters right now. Maybe I'll be wrong. They'll be six or seven guys taken up, picked up tomorrow. But Bruce, I bet you there's maybe one more, maybe two. But they'd so. ra- I think the, the logical sequence is that uh, Ken Holland and Dave Tippett would look at Lagesson first and Bouchard second because they have this free movement. Like if Lagesson plays and they're not happy with him, well, they can call up Bouchard. If they wave Lagos and lose him, Bouchard plays and they're not happy with him, well, then what do they do? Because they've already lost the guy. So, And I, I think there's also a seniority element. I mean, we saw that last year when they kept up, for instance, Brandon Manning and left Caleb Jones down in the minors to, to develop for a while. Like That that's, seems well, to be they, the way Holland does business. If they lost Lagos and they would just play cuckoo, right? Like they do have four. Mm-hmm. They got four guys on the left side with, with, without Lagos is number five. So... Anyway, well, let's leave it there, Bruce. We're going to be okay. having one, we'll probably, one more item. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just um, want to mention Jay Bowmister, uh, Edmonton native, who uh, announced his retirement formally today after uh, having his uh, playing career come to an abrupt halt due to a health issue during a game last season. Uh, retiring after a fantastic career of over 1,200 NHL games. Uh, Jay is so uh, uh, he's the son of Dan Bowmister, longtime assistant coach of the Alberta Golden Bears, and uh, just a phenomenal career that saw him win the world championship two times uh, at ages I think 19 and 20. Uh, he won the uh, World Cup of Hockey in 2004 and again in 2016, 12 years apart, that he was good enough to make Canada's best on best teams. He won the Olympic gold medal in 2014, and of course he won the Stanley Cup in 2019. So he's one of 29 players in the history of the game that are in the so-called triple gold club of of winning the Stanley Cup, uh, the World Championship, and the Olympics. Plus he's got those World Cups, so that's an even more exclusive, smaller group of players that have won all four of those major championships. So my hat is off to Jay for just a fantastic career. It's sad that he had to go out the way he did. But it's fortunate that it happened to him, you know, at age 36 and not 26, you know, that he got basically a full career. And he achieved presumably all of his goals with all those championships. So uh, uh, congrats to him, one of Edmonton's finest uh, to have played in the NHL. Uh, Just a fantastic hockey player. 
fantastic mm-hmm. hockey player. Could he ever skate? Oh, <laughs> yes. The Oilers could use huge guy. The Oilers could use six guys just like him, and they might have one like in Philip Broberry. He, he could be a Bo Meester type of hockey player too. That's that's kind of um, it's the same size and skating ability that we're seeing there. So I recall know. watching him in the 2004-05 season. Uh, AHL season when we had the Edmonton Roadrunners because the NHL was on hiatus for the entire season and going out to see a game with uh, with uh, Bowmister playing in the AHL and developing and at that time he was already a two-time world uh, champion and one-time World Cup champion playing in the AHL and it was like his his skill level was just off the charts compared <laughs> compared to the the quality of play that was on the ice and yet you know he, he didn't so much impose himself on the game as he just made it look totally easy and and you know just did everything right and, and the play flowed through him and there was no problems on his side of the ice and and even as I think twenty year old at that point maybe twenty one I can't remember his exact birthday but anyway he was uh, 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 he was an up-and-comer at that time and a three-time medalist for Team Canada at the World Juniors as well. Like he, he was one of the few 16-year-olds to make, uh, to make the World Junior team, and that's uh, that's a, a very exclusive list of great players who made Team Canada at age 16. Alrighty, Bruce. Let's leave it there. Thanks for talking mm-hmm. today. No, yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.